Welcome to this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Surreal Gerald Quinn, recording a rare, a rare Saturday podcast. We used to remember when we started out, we used to live on Saturdays in terms of recording this podcast. It was the Saturday morning wake up call. But of course, many things have changed about this podcast since then. Um, this is episode 884 of the Real Deal podcast. And before, of course, we get into the NBA, as these conference finals have been nothing short of spectacular. All these games have been close and very you know, extremely hotly contested and certainly a lot of storylines to take from these conference finals. Uh, so up to this point, we have to pay our respects to a legendary figure in the world of athletics on and off the field, uh, Jim Brown passed away on Thursday. It didn't come out, the news didn't come out till, till Friday, but it, he, um, from what I, from all the reports, he passed away, passed away on uh, late Thursday. Um, and they came, it came out on Friday at the age of 87. Brown, of course, was one of the great athletes in the history of North American sports. I mean, let's, let's be, honest about it it's not just you know you'll hear terms like greatest one of the greatest running backs greatest running backs one of the greatest football players no jim brown was one of the greatest athletes produced in north america that's just all like that's it like this guy was all world in football all world in the cross at syracuse like you know there's a, a world in where you know he you know he could have if there was a professional lacrosse you know team league during that time and he joined it and played it, which he probably wouldn't have because play because football was his, you know, was uh was it for him. Uh, once he turned professional, then this guy could have been maybe the greatest across player of all time. Like that's how dominant of an athlete he was. He lettered in four different sports, you know, track and field, football, basketball, lacrosse at Syracuse and was dominant in all of them. Um, you know, high school, you know, he was on teams where he averaged, you know, like thirty six points a game. Uh, a high school basketball player. So this guy was just, you know, whatever the it factor for an athlete physically had it, just had it all, had it all. And, and you know, Jim Brown was a different type of uh, athlete from the standpoint of he was not the, he was nobody's yes man or yes sir, no sir. That was not who he was. That's not what he stood for. He retired after just nine NFL seasons, uh, Played from 57 to 65, retired in 65 after, you know, winning, you know, eight rushing titles in nine seasons and retired as the all-time leader in rushing yards, um, three-time MVP, which is just unheard of for a running back. I mean, we have, you know, you have guys, Barry Sanders has one MVP, Adrian Peterson has an MVP. No, no running backs don't win multiple MVPs, only, only quarterbacks. You look at the course of NFL history have won multiple MVPs. They had three three MVPs as a running back just show you how shows you how dominant he was. So he retires at the age of thirty, still well in his prime because of course he was on the the uh shooting the dirty dozen. Production was running behind. Art Modell was putting pressure on him to come back, right to find him. He do if he would did return the training camp on time, he said, Cool, I'm out. That's it. And that was that. Like we never the football field never saw Jim Brown again. Went on to become a movie star, played in a number of uh westerns and hundred rifles, dirty hundred rifles, uh number of movies over the course of his career. Matter of fact, you know, let's be honest, for me as someone who wasn't born into the late 70s, 78, my first recollection of Jim Brown was as a movie star. Like to be honest, I didn't, you know, I was too young of course, to know about Jim Brown, the legendary football player. But my first recollection of Jim Brown was it was was on the on the, on the silver screen. It was in, in movies like The Running Man and and some of those old westerns that I used to watch with my grandfather growing up. So that was um that was uh my first rec- rec- recollection of uh Jim, Jim Brown, similar to Will Chamberlain. I didn't know Jim I didn't know who Will Chamberlain was as a basketball player because I was too young. I knew Will Chamberlain from as a Mabata in uh, Conan the Barbarian, Barbarian. That's what <laughs> that was my first record. Like, like who's the seven footer playing this villain, uh, trying to trying to kill on Schwarzenegger? That so, so those two, those two had those very those things in common for me personally. But you know, 
you're going to hear a lot of stuff about Jim Brown uh, on and off the field. Um, the one thing, uh, he, listen, it was, it was the total package with Jim Brown. He did. He was not like any of us without his off the field issues. Um, you know, hidden women. Uh, he allegedly threw uh, a woman off the off a second floor balcony, but she recanted that statement. Never pressed charges against him. He admittedly had anger issues. He dealt with a lot of his own personal demons uh, over the course of uh, of his lifetime. He was arrested a number of times. Or domestic and, and physical abuse. Um, so listen, like anybody else, you have to tell when you tell the story of a person, you can't leave nothing out. The you have to tell the entire package, the total story, or it's just not a story without all without without that. Um, but his off the field exploits in terms of impacting the community um uh, have are nothing short of just Spectacular the stuff, the, the some of the stuff that you know he did with with gangs, some of the prison prison reform stuff that he did. Uh, he really dedicated his life towards being towards uplifting the black community. Towards uh, now you get you you'll hear social active you'll hear activists. Not so sure how much of an activist Jim Brown was. Jim Brown was not somebody who was out there. If you remember going back to twenty twenty. He wasn't out there pro- pushing for a protest, okay? <laughs> Jim Brown also visited the White House with, with Donald Trump and Kanye West there. Let's just, you got to keep that in mind as well. That's what I'm saying. We have to tell the entire story when you tell it with Jim Brown. Now, again, I, look, I'm not calling Jim Brown saying that he was selling out to Donald Trump, but I'm just saying that it did not look good. That was not a good optic to be visiting Donald Trump. And so, so is Steve Harvey. I didn't, and I did not. I mean, at the time, I just didn't understand it. Why he or Steve Harvey would go to the White House to to try to talk to somebody who could not be reasoned with. We know anything, anybody knew anything about Donald Trump. Donald Trump was not going to be reasoned with, but Jim Brown felt like you know he could make a difference from that standpoint. Uh, it didn't work out because Trump still was going to do Trump shit. But you know that's you know that's Jim Brown. That Jim Brown felt like that was the power of Jim Brown in terms of feeling like he could impact anything. And he stood up for what he stood, he stood up for, you know, his late friend and now uh, Muhammad Ali, we know Cassius Clay back in the day, that famous picture with you have uh, then, um, you know, he was, he did change his name Muhammad Ali at that time. So let me get that right. So he had the, then Muhammad Ali, Lou Alcindor, who was not Kareem at the time. It was Lou Alcindor, Bill Russell, uh, that again, that that is one of the most famous uh pictures in you know ever you know ever photographed with those guys, um, standing uh standing in solitude for one Muhammad Ali after Muhammad Ali kind of lost his title because of him wanting to uh not go uh, fight for the Vietnam War, so he stood he was the leader of that he was the one that that got that kind of got that the ball rolling on that. And you know he he did his own thing. He was his own man. You no one told Jim Brown what to do. Uh, he didn't do anything that he did not want to do per se. And um, really, one of the first athletes, one of the few athletes to be at goat level to retire when he wanted to retire to walk away when he still had a lot left in the tank. I mean, we saw this with Jordan. We saw it with Wayne Dresky. Those guys most more times than not. You know, we saw it with Muhammad Ali. How difficult it is to walk away strict, strictly on top. I mean, again, there, there are two guys that I can think of that, that did it. They both played football with Jim Brown and Barry Sanders. And as great as Barry Sanders was, and Barry Sanders to me is the best running back that I've seen in my lifetime. Barry Sanders is like not on the level with Jim Brown. Like Jim Brown, uh, as far as running backs goes, I heard Marshall Falk talking about this earlier this week. He says, we all knew. We all knew as running backs that there was Jim Brown and everybody else. Like we were just arguing for two through whatever spots. Like we like it wasn't there was never a conversation about who the greatest running back was amongst the all time great running backs. That's what that's what Marshall Falk said because we everybody Marshall Falk was like everybody knew that there was just I mean, he had his own, you know, he was in his own tier. Uh one of the great again, one of the greatest football players of all time. And a guy who you know, when you talk about legacy, his legacy will certainly will outlive him. You know, we'll be talking about Jim Brown for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, 
uh, with all the records that he with all the things that he did on again on as well as off the field. So, eighty seven years old. Again, you will hear a number of things over the course of the next couple of days about Jim Brown, and there'll be you know there again like, like I mentioned earlier there'll be there'll there'll be some uncovering of his personal life, and again he especially in the Me Too era about his bouts with domestic violence against women. And again, that that is what it is. Like when that happens, uh, that part of the story has to be told. I mean, some people might not might feel like it's disrespectful of his memory, but those things happen. <laughs> That's all this story. He had he put his hands on women. <laughs> like, you know, so um and, you know, if this if it would occur during this era, it would have been, you know, it would have been broadcast to to no end if it, if it happened if it happened in the uh this era and this to the twenty first century, um, uh, we would be talking about it that much more. But it definitely it definitely happened. And uh those, you know, again, he like any other human being, he was not without flaws. And that's and, you know, that's okay. I'm not, not it's not okay to hit women, but it's everybody has their own flaws, everybody has their own personal demons, and he was no different. Um, he again, but you talk about living a full life, you talk about getting the most out of there respective years uh you can't get more out of life than jim brown got from every aspect of it so uh rest in peace to the great one you know, to the great jim brown again one of the great athletes that north america has ever produced and if you don't believe just go listen for especially for, for a younger audience just go look at the numbers go look at he i mean remember he played football when there were 12 most of his career all his career were played with a 12 and 14 game season he never he that forget seven, 16, 16 games or now 17 games. He played where, again, 12 and 14 game seasons. I think the first five years of his career, there were 12 game seasons. The last four years of his career, he played with a 14 game season and still rushed for over 12,000 yards and, and had over 126 touchdowns total between rushing and receiving. He there, He is without question one of the five greatest football players to ever play um to me to ever play uh in conversation you know again we'll you know brady because of what he's done at the quarterback and um minus tom brady i can put him i can make a case that he's the greatest football player of all time like the greatest non quarterback we're talking about let's say non let's put non quarterbacks for a second let's let, let's put the quarterbacks aside make a case he's in that conversation with lawrence taylor jerry rice um as as the greatest non quarterback to ever play football, he's right. If if not if not number two, if not number one in terms of the greatest non quarterback to ever play football, that's how dominant this man was. A shocking, I guess we shouldn't be shocked anymore, considering how just wild this postseason has been. Number seven seed, number eight seed in the conference finals. Yeah, you know. Both we have uh, a one uh, a one seed in the Eastern Conference, the team with the best record out the playoffs. So a lot of crazy things have, have happened over the course of this postseason. So I guess I, I guess it's you know my mistake or our mistake to continuously being surprised about what we see. But what but what transpired last night, I I didn't see coming. Uh, Miami goes into Boston for the second uh, straight game, takes down the Celtics one eleven to one hundred five, and they go up take a, a commanding two nothing uh two nothing lead over at Boston in the best of seven uh going home to Miami tomorrow evening um uh, for games three and of course games four on game four will be on Tuesday. Um listen I like so when we get into the game like you can no longer say that Miami that is outlandish if if you can't be shocked if Miami walks away this year with a championship. You just can't be. Because the bottom line is there's no dominant team left. All these teams are flawed. Um they have a they have right now the second best playoff player right now in the playoff player in Jimmy But in Jimmy Butler. They have the without question the best coach remaining in the playoffs. Without it's not even that's and frankly all the respect to all the other three coaches it's not even close. And they have a mentality that is just, you know, you want to call it heat culture. You want to call them just, uh, you know, just understanding, knowing what it takes to do what it takes in the playoffs. They they have an unflappable mentality as a team. That's all there is to it. Um, 
Looking at the game last night, uh, for the second straight game, this game was decided in one quarter, in essence, decided this game. Game three, game, excuse me, game one, it was the 45, 45, 46 point third quarter that decided the game. And last night, it was the 36 point, 30, they, they outscored Boston 36 to 22 in the fourth quarter when it seemed like Boston had taken control late in the third, early in the fourth. Uh, Tatum started making shots. Even, you know, Grant Williams got going, and we'll give we'll talk more about that. And it seems like, you know, Miami was going to be like, you know, they'll, it'll be one of those games where Boston's going to run away with a nice 12 to 13 point victory. But Miami wasn't having it. Uh, Grant Williams makes it three. Uh, and then Miami goes on this 20 to nine run after Grant Williams makes a three and, and for whatever reason starts talking trash to Jimmy Butler, Jimmy, Jimmy Butler, who was six for seven against Grant Williams' defense, by the way, uh, when they were matched up, he was six for seven against Grant Williams and just abused Grant Williams. And, and again, that, that to me, that just can't happen. If you're Joe, Joe Missoula, you can't have Grant Williams on Jimmy Butler. Grant Williams is a nice defensive player, decent defensive player. I, out of all the, out of all the top defensive players that Boston has, I'm not putting Grant with that out. Like, I'm not, that matchup is not happening. Really, from a matchup standpoint, uh, Malcolm Bogdan has probably done the best job on Jimmy Butler. But it, whether you want to do Butler, whether you want to do Brogdon, or you could do Tatum, or even Jalen Brown, Grant Williams is not even coming. Like no, or even Derek White for that matter. Like I would take any of those guys on Jimmy Butler outside of, um, but not Grant Williams. And by the way, Grant Williams before this game, but it barely had played. What he wasn't even in the rotation during these playoffs, so they dust him off. And you know he made you know he comes in makes a couple of shots, uh, but was just destroyed defensively by one uh, Jimmy Butler after talking trash to him. Listen, Miami is just tougher. They're just tougher. They they were tougher than Milwaukee. They were tougher than New York, and they mentally they are mentally tougher than Boston. That's all there is to it. Like they, um, anytime Boston hits them with a run, they have an answer. They, you know, Bam goes out there, and to me, Bam was the best. Bam Adebayo was the best player on the court um, last night. Twenty-two, seventeen, and nine with great defense. Or twenty-two, seventeen, and nine with great defense. Bam had a big fourth quarter. Uh, the same issues that continued to plague Boston during the season when they didn't win games continued to plague them during the playoffs. It is three-point shooting or the lack thereof uh, when they lose. They were ten for thirty-five from the three-point line last night. Ten for thirty-five. This series, Boston is only shooting 31% from the three-point line. I repeat, they're only shooting 31%. Uh, you have Tatum, you had a rough day for Jalen, a rough night for Jalen Brown, 7 to 23 for the field, 16 points. Um, Tatum, you know, had a very good game. I'm Listen, I'm not going to go crazy about, like, fourth quarter Tatum. I think that, you know, that's become a narrative over the course of this, this series. I'm saying that he's disappeared during the fourth quarter because he doesn't have a field goal. He does have 11 fourth in the in the fourth quarter. He does have 11 fourth quarter free throws made in the fourth quarter in the two fourth quarters in the, in the series. So I don't not, I don't think that it's been lack of aggression from Jason Tatum in the fourth quarter of the series. I think that I I look at Joe Mazzula. I think that they have done a poor job of getting him the basketball. Uh, and put him in, putting him in various positions to attack Miami's defense in the fourth quarter. That's what I've seen. I can't say my I can't sit here and come up with a situation. Have a situation. It be a situation with Jason Tatum. The moment is too big for Jason Tatum, and he's running away, running away from the ball in the fourth quarter. That's not happening. He's because he, he's getting to the line, so he's getting shots. He's getting um, not like he's not getting shot us up, shots up. It's just the places where you know the. Places where they're not giving him the ball at the right in his, you know, quote unquote sweet sweet spots. And again, if you want to criticize Tatum saying that he really doesn't have a sweet spot as far as where to attack the defense uh when it comes down to these close games and what have you, that's fair as well, because he still has not developed a, a legit post game and you know that that drop dead mid range game. That is the next step of his evolution to me, is being is him is him getting a post game. Yeah, uh, because he's he's going to be taller and bigger than most of the players that he plays against. At you know, see, they say he's six nine, but he's, they say that he's actually closer to six ten. So that's just the next step of his game. But 
I'm not gonna kill Jason Tatum for what he's done in this series. Um, you look at the he in this in these two games, Tatum is averaging as I look uh look at look at now. He is this series, Tatum is at about thirty. Yeah, Tatum is at about thirty over thirty a game in this series. He's yeah, thirty two, ten and four uh in this series. He's averaging thirty two points, ten rebounds, uh, in this series. Um, so I I can't get on him that bad with, with those type of numbers. Um shooting fifty one percent. Uh now again, only shooting thirty percent from the three point range, but um he is at like, and he's been like I said, he's been getting to the line. Like he's been getting to, he, 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 I mean, he's been getting to the line. Um, again, thirty-two. He is a minus on plus minus. He's a minus two and a half, but thirty-two, uh, thirty-two and ten on fifty-one percent field goal percent fifty on fifty-one percent. That's hard to knock. Uh, now Jalen again. Jalen Brown has been a has been has not played well in this series to, up to this point. Only nineteen, only shooting thirty-eight percent. From uh, only shooting thirty eight percent from the field in this series, so he has not um, he has not produced. And to me, I look at Boston's problems. I, to me, they start out before I get to Miami. I look at Boston problems. To me, their number one problem is the coach. Like I, I don't like this mentality. They have given up. You know, they're let again. Miami has in game one. Miami goes one hundred and twenty three in regulation. They had what the forty five point third quarter. Um they outshoot Boston. Like game one, they have the uh, the thirty five point third quarter. They the but the Boston issue to me is defensive identity. They lack a defensive identity with this coach. And when your coach and one of the reasons why they lack a defensive identity is because your coach, your head coach, is always talking about offense. Every time you go look at Joe Mazzula's press conferences, they'll ask him, you know, it it really stood out to me. Now, by the way, the Boston, Boston fans have been talking about this all year long with him, so this is nothing new. Uh, if you're Boston fans, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but I, again, I don't follow the Celtics as closely as, as a Boston fan because I'm not a Boston fan, but I, I watched enough Celtic games, uh, watched a number, number of eight games, but didn't really follow, you know, Joe Pizzula's, uh post-game press conferences to that extent. But in the playoffs, they have stood out. Uh, you go back to that game seven against Philadelphia, and yes, Tatum had fifty-one points, but the difference in that game was the third was a third quarter. Remember, that was a tie game at halftime. A third quarter stretch where Boston outscores Miami, outscored not Miami, outscored uh Philly thirty-three to ten in the third quarter. And that was the game. They outscored it by twenty-three points in a quarter, and helped Philly score this for over six and a half minutes. And both Joe Mazzula brings up the team's offensive spacing as being a as as being one of the key the keys. Uh, to getting that separation, I'm like, dude, you held the team to ten points. Like we, like, what are we talking about here? But so, but that's who. We, like, but that, you know, that is what he is. He believes in offense. Everything is about predicated around the offense, around our spacing, making threes. He's a, has his emphasis. He wants to get up anywhere from forty five to fifty threes a game. That's another great. That's another thing that's been key in this series. Uh, game one, they only got Miami. Miami has held them. Game one, uh, Boston got up 29 threes. In this game, they got up 35. So Miami has ran them off the 35, off the three-point line, has forced them to take some tough twos or even conceded, you know, some layups at times too because they know how big of a factor the three-point shot is in that Boston offense. And to me, what, it, what has happened with Boston offensively is they have only have one way that they can beat you, and that's with the three-point shot. And that In the playoffs, listen, in the playoffs, when you know you have the best coaches, the best players going up against the best scouting, they're, you know, a good team is going to, especially when you get to the level of conference finals or NBA finals, that's similar to what Golden State did to Boston last year. They're going to be able to take away something that you take away something that you do well. You have to be able to pivot. You have to have another way to win a basketball game when you get to this level. That's all it is to it. Like, you, know, like you can't be a one-trick pony and expect to compete and win an NBA championship. And that's the only goal Boston has left. They Boston has done everything. They've been to a number of conference finals. They've been to the NBA finals last year. It's about winning a title. 
and coming into the series, coming into these conference finals, Boston was was uh the favorites to win it all. Uh one of the favorites to win it all, pure and simple. And they consider on paper probably had the most complete team from one to you know, from one to eight, one to seven, uh, with a ton of experience, with uh, you know, with that core that that uh Tato Brown smart core had been had been has been in a number of conference finals. Again, we're in the NBA finals last year. So everything is right was right there for Boston. No Milwaukee home court advantage if if they even if they get to the NBA finals, everything is right there for Boston. But to me, I don't see a lot of people are not a lot of people are not going to count Boston out. Well, I'm going to count them out. Uh, injuries withstanding, how many teams have come back from a down 0 2 when they've lost the first two games at home? Now, you had the 2017 Celtics against the Bulls in the first round series, but you remember, Rajon Rondo got hurt in that series, and that shift that changed the whole dynamic of that series. And Boston ended up winning that series in seven games against Chicago, against Chicago in the first round. I believe that, that was a first round series in 2017. Um, it, it when you you injuries were standing when another team walks into your building and takes the first two games, that tells you basically all you need to know about the direction of that series. And again, right now Miami is playing with just unbelievable confidence. Uh, they love that whole nobody believes in us chip on their shoulder. They are just they 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 love it. They have a top player right now who they're following. And by the way, they're getting enough, more than enough from their role players uh, on a nightly basis. Like last night, you go, you look last night, you get 40 out of out of uh, Caleb Barton and, and uh, Duncan Robson. One night, it might be Vincent. Another night, it might be um, the, uh, I'm missing the, uh, one of the other guys who has uh, – Kyle Lowry, who hasn't been good in this particular series, but was, Lowry did hit some big shots in Game One, but overall, uh, wasn't good, really, really wasn't good last night. But I mean, they have a uh, Kevin Love. Uh, Kevin Kevin Love has has been good in the series at all. Uh, they've been better without without him on the court. But to my point, they have a lot of veteran players. They have veteran champions. Kevin Love is a champion. Kyle Lowry is a champion on that on that roster. And they have a tough, I mean, you know, you, Haslam doesn't play, but his presence on that bench is, you know, obviously they've kept him around all these years, not just because, you know, not just as a as a means to do him a favor, but they his leadership and uh, this will be his last year, of course, uh, has actually obviously has meant something. And if you look at Miami's run in these playoffs, they have not given up games for the most part. Like they win game now with the exception of game two in Milwaukee, where they got their doors blown off, for the most part, when they they've hand, they have handled prosperity as well as any team in this postseason. They win game two, they win game three and four against Milwaukee. They wrap it up in five at Milwaukee. When we all thought, including myself included, that they were going to go that if they were going to wrap it up, it was going to be in game six in Milwaukee. You look at uh, the Knicks series; they win game one and nearly, nearly without Jimmy Butler, uh, almost win game two. They go out there um, and finish it off in six games. I get an extra credit for game five, for winning game five um, in New York. But even that game was tough up until, you know, up until up until like the fourth quarter or what have you. So, and now in this series, you know, you win game one, you figure, all right, we can relax. We got home court. No, no, no. They come out there right away and push Boston to the limit and put Boston in a position to where, where you want to put Boston in. And, and that is in clutch situations. Uh, Boston has not been a very good clutch team, and that, and that is being you know, that is five minutes with the game under five, with five minutes remaining. That is what the clutch, you know, that that defines a clutch game. Uh, five minutes with let five with the game being um, decided by five points or less, or within five points or less, and let's and let's be honest. I mean that. Boston, you know, Miami down the stretch of these games is just far superior in terms of execution. Like Boston's offense in that fourth quarter was looking, was just all over the place. They were scattered. They looked unsure of themselves. They didn't look like they had a plan of a plan of attack. 
to be honest with you. Yeah, Jason Table dribbling the ball, you know, 20, 30, 25 to 30 feet from the basket, trying to attack a zone defense that like I they look again, they had a number of possessions that would go down to like the last the last five seconds of the shot clock. They again they looked extremely unsure of what they of what they were trying to accomplish offensively. And I think that go I think one of the reasons for that is because you count too much on the three point shot. You count too much on the three point shot. In comparison to Miami, like look, you know, we're gonna run our offense through Jimmy Butler. A run of offense through Jimmy Butler. Either he's going to score score on somebody, or he's going to make the right play to get somebody a, a, a great shot. You look at Denver; they're going to run their offense through Joker. Either he is going to get get fouled, score, or get somebody a great shot. Those two teams know who they are, uh, in particular offensively, and know what they want to do offensively. Even with the Lakers, with their struggle, you know, with the Lakers. You know, LeBron James is going to have the ball in his hands and he's going to make plays and what have you. And, you know, they're going to, from that standpoint. But out of these four teams, Austin looks as unsure themselves, unsure themselves offensively as any, as any of these four teams remaining, or of the final four teams remaining by far, in terms of what, especially in late game situations. They, most of these, again, folks, most of these games are going to be close games for the most part. You look at these conference finals, all these, all four of these games have been decided by uh, seven points or less. And they've all been fourth quarter games. There have, there have been no blowouts or there have been no games that were decided. They're, they've all been decided in the last three to four minutes of the fourth quarter. So it comes down to knowing who you are, offensive execution, and knowing who you are and having the ball in the play in the right. The, having the ball in the hands of the right player, the right players. So I don't see Boston coming back in the series. Can they win a game? Can they possibly get to six? Maybe, maybe. But coming back to win this series, there's nothing that I see that would make me believe that they can come back and win this series. And again, I don't care how well they've played on the road. Miami has been great at home during the course of these, during this postseason. I don't, I don't care how well Boston has, has, has played uh, on the road. Um, now, do I see a sweep? No. I think Boston will get one game in Miami. Uh, we'll get one game in Miami. I don't see a sweep, but I, I just cannot see Boston coming back uh, to win this series. Miami is too disciplined. They're too well coached. They have too much great leadership. Uh, and Jimmy Butler looks like a man, just frankly, looks like a man on a mission right now with, with, the, with how he's playing. And Bam Albio has stepped up big time uh, over the course of the last six, five, six playoff games. You look at his numbers as, as going, have, have gone up. He struggled at the beginning of the Milwaukee series, but ever since, you know, in the last five, six playoff games, Bam, they've got great production out of Bam. You know what you're going to get defensively out of Bam. Uh, defensively, he's an all-league defensive player of year candidate every year. His offense can come and go, especially scoring-wise, but uh, lately he's played extremely well. And you got him going – all they need is one more player to step up, and that that they become a dangerous, dangerous basketball team. As far as the Western Conference Finals, um, I didn't. I don't think anybody expected it to be two nothing Denver. I thought even after Game One, I thought you know I thought Denver would win Game One, and the Lakers would come back in Game Two, uh, uh and, and and tie that series up. I had Denver win the series in seven games. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that right now because that game too was right on the platter for the Lakers. Denver did not play well in, the, in that game. Um, when you think about it, Denver, um, you get a average Jokic game, and again, this is how dominant he is. He still had triple double, but he shot nine for twenty one from the field. Shot nine for twenty one. LeBron did an excellent job on him. He was zero for six against LeBron James when they matched up. Uh, and LeBron, and that probably contributed to LeBron's uh, fatigue uh, in that fourth quarter and some of his fourth quarter struggles. Um, you get 43 combined from Hachimura and Austin Reeves. Um, you got to win that game. Uh, the key, so this was a 82 to 81 game uh, in early, like early in the fourth quarter. Joker goes out for a sub, goes out for uh, for a rest. Um, they're up 
They were, uh, excuse me, they were down by one. Denver, Lakers are up 8-81 when Joker goes out. When he was turned, Denver was up by four. So they were a plus five with Joker on the bench. That can't, you have, that can't happen. Like that, like you cannot be, earlier in the game when Joker went out, Denver was a minus eight. That's what it has to look like. Those, those Joker minutes, they, the Lakers have to win those Joker minutes when he's on the bench. Like they have to win those minutes. And then the floodgates open in the fourth quarter with, of course, Jamal Murray going berserk, 23 points. He finishes with 37. Uh, LeBron James struggled, struggles in the fourth quarter. During that time, he missed three threes. I don't know why. Again, only fatigue. That I don't know why he was settling for three-point shots when they had no answer for him when he went to the when he was going to the basket. Um, but to me, that to me, when he starts jacking jumpers up, that's a sign that he is is getting tired, either tired or getting tired. Um, you had three Denver starter the starters in that fourth quarter who were held scoreless. Three, three Denver starters who were including Jokic. Jokic did not score in the fourth quarter of the game. So that's a game that the Lakers have to win when Joker is average, and when it took, in essence. In essence, uh, uh, Jamal Murray, who coming into that fourth quarter was only like five for seventeen, entered the, that fourth quarter before he went crazy. Like that's a game the Lakers just can't afford to can't afford to lose. Can't lose. Uh, D'Angelo Russell has been bad in the series. They've been a minus forty one with him on the floor in the series. I don't think this is a series for him. To be honest with you. So I'd rather go much go with the, I'd rather go with Stroder. Uh, I think they're gonna they're gonna have to turn to Stroder. The Lakers' best lineup is Stroder. Reeves, LeBron, AD, and Hachimura. That is going to be their money lineup, especially down the stretch. That's their best lineup, their most versatile lineup, obviously, and defensively. But ultimately, this comes down to, to me, this comes down to what it's come down to in all these playoffs in regards to how, what, where or not the Lakers are going to win or lose. Is Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis, you can't go from 40 to 18. I guess, especially against this Denver team. Anthony Davis, yeah, he had 14 rebounds and four block shots, but you like 18 points is not going to do it against this explosive offense against Denver because you can't only you can only hold Denver down for so much for so long. They had Denver. Denver had 48 points at half. Um, there was only one 30 point quarter in this in this game, and that was about Denver in the fourth quarter. They scored ended up scoring 32. Like Denver scored on only 108 points. That's a that's great defense. You hold Denver to. 110 or less that you're doing your job because this team is going to live in the one in the 120s 150 they're going to be around between 115 to 125 that's how i mean that's how explosive they are offensively they are a great great offensive basketball team that's all it is to it so when you hold them to one at 108 you got to win that game you got to win that game i thought the Lakers defense played well for the most part i did but you know, you go, you get James and Davis between them, thirteen for thirty-four. That's not going to get it done, and especially Anthony Davis. I mean, you know, LeBron was still. I, I don't. I think LeBron offensively had some bad, took some bad shots in the fourth quarter, but he's guarding Jokic, so it's like something has to give from that standpoint. LeBron is no longer at the point of his career as a two-way player where he's going to dominate on both ends of the floor. So you're asking him to guard Jokic. Especially in the fourth quarter of a of a of a of a emotional and just highly intense Western Conference Finals game, then somebody else offensively has to step up, and and that somebody else has to be Anthony Davis because you got again you got forty three out of Hachimura and Austin Reeves, so they did their they more than did their jobs. Matter of fact, through the course of this series between the two of them, they're both they're averaging forty points combined between the two of them. They're doing they've been they Hachimura and Reeves have been great in this series. OK, so uh, up to this point, you, I can't ask for anything more out of them, especially on the road. But again, game two, you know, game two comes out to Anthony Davis. It's all this to it comes out to Anthony Davis. Game one, uh, you're not like you're not going to win a shootout against Denver. Like that, like you just that 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 the pace was too fast. You're not winning that game against them, but the Lakers. You, we knew that the Lakers would not can't cannot keep up that level of shooting and, and offensive productivity. They, that's just not yeah like like that. That's just unrealistic. And I know Denver is not a good defensive team, but the Lakers are not a great offensive team. Lakers make their money, make their mark on defense. 
this has to be a defensive series if the Lakers would have any chance of winning, want to win, have any chance of winning. If it's, if it's up and down, offensive, and the floodgates start opening, that that's where Denver is just the best in the league right now. So, listen, the first two games have been, a, you had a six-point game. They had a three-pointer to tie in game one. Game two, you had a fourth-quarter lead, and you lose a um, – a five-point game. So the series has been extremely close. Uh, the Lakers have been great at home. They've been undefeated up to this point at home. We saw Denver lose uh, back-to-back home, back-to-back road games to Phoenix. Uh, we saw them lose a road game to Minnesota in game three. So it's, it's not like Denver has been great on the road. They've been dominant on the road. But with this schedule being every other day, I, I just wonder how much gas is going to be left in the tank for the Lakers and with, with Davis and, and James. James and Davis playing the amount of minutes that they're playing, especially James, especially LeBron James. And Denver, does, from that standpoint, is the younger team. They are the team that wants to get down, up and down the floor. Uh, I expect the Lakers to win game three, and I think game four will tell us everything we need to, we need to know about this series. That's what I expect. If this is a close game in game three, that favors Denver. I think a close fourth quarter game, but that's why I have to get an edge to Jokic and Jamal Murray because those guys can be one of those two guys. Both of them can take over. One of them, more than likely, is going to take over in a close, in a, in a, in a very close uh, contested game. Joker will bounce back on that performance in game two. I promise you, he will. And to match, Anthony Davis has to bounce back in game three for the Lakers to, for the Lakers to have any chance. Again, this is this is not a series for De, for D'Angelo Russell. It's just not. I would like if he plays, I would keep him in that. Like, there's no way he's sniffing thirty minutes to me. I if I'm if I'm uh, if I'm Darvin Ham, D'Angelo Russell plays. Between twenty and twenty five minutes. That's it. And he's not. He's not going to be a part unless he has one of those nights where he hits like a bunch of threes where he starts off high. You can tell. You can tell early when 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 Russell has a go. If Russell is going to have a a good offensive game, you can tell early. And you're not keeping him in for defense. That's not. It's not his forte. So, I would uh, go lean towards more Stroder, lean towards more the, the defensive end, and tell Anthony Davis. You know. You know, dude. You got to be at worst. The second best player on the floor. Now, I because that's the thing about this. I thought for the Lakers to realistic, realistically win a championship, Anthony Davis would have to be the best player on the floor. I don't think so. And, and watching these first two games, because I, I think that if he's close to Jokic, if he's the second best player in the series, I think they actually would have a chance because the role players they've gotten enough out of their role players, and LeBron's going to give you a steady dose. You know, LeBron's going to give you you know twenty three, eight and seven, and you know be and, and have an impact defensively, um, somewhat defensively as he has in the first two games. So uh, LeBron's going to be solid enough to give you uh, in terms of uh, contrib- in terms of giving you a contribution. But it's all about Anthony Davis. Um, you can't, so far in this series, Jokic and Murray have been the two best players in this series. Can't have, it can only be one. If Jokic is the best player, okay. But you can't have Jokic and Murray be Number one and to be the two best players in the series, and for the Lakers to have expect the Lakers to have any chance uh, to win this series. Now we'll see. Listen, Denver has crossed off. Uh, you know, you look for a team that's trying to break through and win the championship. You look for championship checkpoints. Uh, they crossed a big one. You know, with feet in the Phoenix series, winning those last two games, winning Game Six, just destroying Phoenix on the road. Uh, game Two, I thought was a big one for them as well. Uh, winning that game, a defensive game, when it, it was a choppy game, it was a physical game. They had to come back. They were down double digits in the game. They had a big fourth quarter, so that was a check. That was a checkpoint. That was they they the first they had the first team in the playoffs to you know go up to all against the Lakers. So that was a a a minor checkpoint. Win a game where they not where they don't play it necessarily great. Uh, so we'll see if they can get up to get the big checkpoint and that's take one of these next. Two home games, road games on against a Laker team that has been great, been dominant at home. Lakers have had have blown some people out, uh, at home. You think about what they did to uh the Grizzlies in games three, 
and games um, three and six. Um, what they did to Golden State in games three and also then game six as well. So they've had some dominant performances at home. Uh, we'll see what type of – listen, we're going to learn about this early. The first quarter will tell you all you need to know about uh, this particular game. It really will. And we had the draft lottery earlier this week. Um, and, of course, the Spurs. Oh, the Spurs. You get, you know, you get David Robinson in 87. Um, and of course, he couldn't play until 89 because he had the two, he had the uh, served a couple of years with the, with the Navy. You get, uh, then you get Tim Duncan in 97. And, you know, five championships later, your franchise is, is set for a, an entire basically generation. Now they go out there and they get uh, Victor Wimbayama. You know, it took me three or four years to pronounce Atenacupo. So, you know, this one would maybe take maybe maybe a year, maybe like maybe a year or two. When Yana Yama, uh, a seven foot five um guy who frankly we've never seen we've never seen a player like this with this skill set, with the size and skill set. Um he's considered to be, you know, number one prospect in the history of the NBA. Um better prospect. Uh now here's here's what I'll say. Like is he a better prospect than LeBron? Yes, he is. And, you know, I, I heard that argument um, over the course of a couple of days, and you had the course of the, the LeBron stands just completely refute that. But it, it is the bottom line about when I compare him to LeBron as a high school, as a, as a number one prospect. LeBron just offensively, when you look at, first of all, defensively is not in comparison. This guy, he could walk in next year and be a, a defensive player of the year candidate. Like, seriously, he's that dominant defensively. So that's not even a comparison. LeBron wasn't all defense in the NBA until, like, year five with Cleveland, talking about 08, 09 season. Um, shooting, no comparison. LeBron's jump shot didn't come about until years, again, three, four, or year, even years three and four. It took LeBron a number of years to develop his jump shot. This guy is walking in with, with three-point range. And I'm talking about catch and shoot pull-up jump shots, like stuff that LeBron did not have. Now, when you give LeBron, uh, you give LeBron the edge with, with uh, I would say, court vision, passing, and just physicality as far as, and LeBron had an NBA body. But this guy, again, this guy is a seven foot five, can put the ball on the floor, and can be a dominant defensive player. Like, the, I mean, he's the, the next in terms of the evolution of basketball. He's just a better prospect. I mean, that's all there is to it. I mean, that's, He's just a better prospect than LeBron James was. But he is he the greatest number one prospect of all time? No. No. So I was did a little thought exercise. And to me, thinking about who, like, the criteria for greatest prospect. What is the criteria for greatest NBA prospect, like, that you had in terms of, is it like you have uh, the most attention, the guy that's got the most attention, like how how what I don't I don't quite understand the 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 criteria because if we're talking about hype then of course it's LeBron he grew up in the social media area era but if we're talking about skill in terms of impact in that immediate impact then to me the greatest prospect of all time is Kareem now you remember Kareem went to high with the college four years. Played three of those years. They were freshmen were not eligible at UCLA during that during that particular time. Um, he came in ready made. Like when I mean ready made, he came in. Kareem as a rookie was 28, 14, and four. Second team All NBA. Uh, number top three, number three in, in voting, and second team All Defense. Like you can't like that. Like there's no topping that as a rookie. He's a rookie. Right, so I put so I can't put LeBron. I I can't put LeBron over Kareem from that standpoint in terms of who had the most impact on the game immediately. And no, I don't even have LeBron number two. You know, I have number two as the most number two impactful number one prospect, Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan goes to Wake Forest four years, polished offensively, defensively, the whole nine. Comes in immediately, 21, 12, two and a half blocks, first team All NBA. He finished second team all defense was second team all defense and finished fifth in the MVP balloting. 
and immediately San Antonio went from a 26 win team to like a 50. I think they won 56 games that year before getting eliminated by Utah in the in the first round of the Western Conference in '98. Of course, they would win the championship the following year in, in that lockout shortened season. But immediately, Tim Duncan is a All League MVP count. Immediately, like Tim Duncan was a legit top five player in his first year, like his first season in the NBA. He was legitimately one of the top five players in the league. And third, I have LeBron. Now, the, the Magic fans might get upset. On the, but I had LeBron third. LeBron came in straight out of high school, okay, which, you know, and again, we're not talking about the number one high school prospect of all time. We're talking about the number one prospect of all time as far as number one picks. So there's a difference. If we, if we base this just strictly on high school, then LeBron clearly would be number one. I think it would be probably LeBron, you know, Garnett, Kobe, somewhere, or maybe not even that. I mean, I'll have to do some more research on that. But LeBron would be clearly number one if we just based it off – High school prospects to come out of guys to come out of uh, high school straight to the NBA. LeBron, his first year, uh, basically was 21, five and a half rebounds, almost six assists, and finished amazingly ninth at the MVP ballot. And despite being on a terrible team, which the Cleveland Cavaliers in his rookie season was on, were a terrible team. Now, this was the only year that LeBron was not on any of the all NBA teams and was not an all star. Only year of his career. So he was not an all-star and was not on any of the all-NBA teams. I had Magic fourth. Magic came out, of course, after two years of Michigan State. Um, won a championship, beat Bird, of course, in that famous uh, game, uh, Michigan State versus Indiana State. Immediately, Magic was 18-7-7. He was an all-star, and, of course, he was the finals MVP. Magic was not on any of the all-NBA teams, uh, and he was not even in the – did not even – was not even in a whiff within uh, uh, close to a, on the MVP, wasn't even on the MVP ballot. There were only nine people that I look at, I did the research, there were only nine MVP candidates, guys that got MVP votes that year who were on, even on the ballot. Magic was not on them. Matter of fact, Magic didn't still get, he did not get start, get, did not get a MVP consideration till like year three of his career. That's when he started. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm confident about those two. Like Kareem, Duncan, LeBron. Yeah, those are the three greatest number one prospects of all time. Now, if Wimbayana comes in next year and it's like, you know, twenty ten defensive player a year candidate, eh, maybe I maybe I, I can put him as an all NBA player. Maybe he challenges LeBron for number three. I don't see him doing I like I don't see him passing those first two though. Kareem and Duncan were just all world their first year first years in the NBA as rookies. Like I don't I, I don't see that. But who knows? This guy, they're talking about this guy is just this out of this world prospect. No guy has been there's there hasn't been a more hyped player coming out um as a number one prospect since LeBron. So he has that going for him. He goes to a perfect situation with the Spurs. I he cannot go to a better situation uh as far as culture, as far as he can actually grow small market you know what i'm saying it is a it is a perfect situation they know they will know how to handle him pop of course coach duncan coach robinson coach a number of veteran players coach a number of foreign players especially french players so i, I they they have their posts on that part of the game the spurs no, no one scouts the european has scouted european talent better than san antonio spurs over the court, you look at Ginobili and Parker and some of the guys they've got picked up at free agency or or free agency or you know off the scrap heap. Even the guy like Boris Diaw, if you remember, they are a team that 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 scouts European players better than anyone over the past uh, twenty to twenty five to thirty years over the past, especially in the, in the very popish era. So basically, the past twenty to twenty five years since he has been their coach, the general manager and coach. So uh, I think this guy, to me, if I look at like his to me, his upside. I look at him like a guy who could be one of the top ten to five players of all time. He has that type of ceiling, I, and I would lean towards top five. He had like he has, and he had again. He had like Giannis. He has not been Americanized. Like I don't see this guy getting all getting all caught up in being a celebrity and all that bullshit. I, he looks like somebody who's just strictly focused on basketball and looks like again health withstanding because we know how challenging it could be for guys that height with the feet, the back, the knees, and what have you, he stays healthy. I think this guy, without question, will be an, an all-time great. 
That's going to wrap it up in this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast. I will see you again in a couple of days as we continue to look at the NBA Finals. And we'll talk. We'll start talking about some the coaching carousel. So we didn't get into that. We'll get into that in the next podcast as well. Have a great, great rest of your weekend. So long.